Hey ACF, I'm super excited to be back here with you guys, getting into the Word of God, reading His Word together. If you got a Bible, open it up with me. We're going to jump into 1 Peter chapter 3. But before we do that, because we took a little break, going through Matthew, listening to Brett, uh, talking about being the salt and the light. It was a great, great little expedition. Um, I want to remind you of the context behind these passages. And, and I believed it was 1 Peter 2, verses 11 through 12. It says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Peter's writing to people who are either persecuted, about to be persecuted, or just getting out of persecution. Um, and he, he, this call in this last couple weeks that we've studied it has been for you and I to be very aware of the way we're living our lives and realizing that we represent the Lord Jesus Christ no matter what we're doing or no matter what our social status is or relationship status or however you want to put it. And so Peter talked about slaves submitting to masters for the sake of the gospel. Just as Christ was treated wrongfully and just received it, these people who were in this position where they were abused by their masters, he goes, hey, you got to bear it for the sake of Christ. He talked to wives who are married to unbelieving husbands that they would love them and submit to them to see their wives or to see their husbands won over for the gospel. You know, he talked to husbands that they would dwell with understanding with their wives, giving them honor. And I think it's just so real, this last chapter and the applications from it. And if you missed out on those messages, I encourage you to go back, read through the passages and listen to those messages because they're convicting for you and I. When we realize that, we can't always change the way people treat us. And we won't always be able to get the justice that we deserve in the moment. But we are responsible for how we respond and act in that moment, especially how we represent our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Peter's kind of continuing that thought, jumping into verse 8, and it's an exhortation to all of us. And it says this, verse 8, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender hearted and courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that we may inherit a blessing. Man, if we all lived by this for our Facebook posts, social media would be a way better place, just a side note. But listen to what he says, finally, all of you, Finally, and by the way, if you know any good pastor, when they say finally, they're not nearly done. Peter's actually got two more chapters to go. But he says, all of you be of one mind, that you and I are to be united as a body and family of Christ. The Bible would tell us that we're to have the mind of Christ and that that mind is to unite us. We're one family. We have one Lord. We have one baptism. We have one saving grace. There's one spirit of God in all of us. And you and I are to seek to be united as the family of Christ. And you know what? Right now, that's a big word for us. It's hard for us to be un united. In fact, we find ourselves divided through our political standpoints or our opinions or perspectives. And Peter's exhortation to the church is, hey, you got to be, you need to be, like-minded. And here are some things that are going to help you be like-minded. He said, having compassion for one another. Pastor Mark and I just did a podcast on compassion based on this passage, and I encourage you to go listen to it if you haven't. We really dive into just the idea of compassion throughout Scripture and, and how it relates to God and to you and I. But I want to say this to you. When you're talking about compassion, you need to understand how God is compassionate. And the Old Testament says this about God. It says he is full of compassion, full of compassion. And that's hard for people to understand. Sometimes people look at the Old Testament and they go, it feels like a different God. No, it's the same God actually. And in his absolute nature, he is full of compassion. Always, even in judgment, he's full of compassion. 
If you don't believe me, go read the book of Jonah. A people deserving of judgment. God sends the reluctant prophet. And when the people turn, they don't even know the Lord, but they just respond out of obedience. God is moved with compassion for them. Spares them. And that's the second thing you see about God in the New Testament applied to Jesus often is that he is moved with compassion. He saw the crowds like sheep without a shepherd and he's moved with compassion, stirred deeply. And as that relates to you and I, he told the parable of the master who had a servant who owed him more than he could ever pay. And Jesus says the master was moved with compassion and forgave the servant. In fact, Jesus is explaining through the parable the work of the cross and what he's done for you and I. He's the master who's moved with compassion to forgive those who come to him and ask for his help, his servants. And this man is forgiven of everything. And then when that servant goes and he refuses to show light compassion and forgiveness towards others, the master's angry in his heart because he said, I forgave you of this huge debt. How could you not forgive someone else of the small debt? And that's a word for you and I. This is what the Lord wants for us. He's been moved with compassion for you and I. He's forgiven. He's touched. He's made clean. And he wants you and I to be compassionate towards one another as well. So don't miss out on that podcast. You, you want to jump in and listen to it. You can find it on our website or on our app. So be compassionate or having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. It's a phileo love, a brotherly love, a family love. We're to love each other like we're family. Family doesn't always get along, but family is forever. You know, people say you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. Well, it's kind of true that way in church. You know, we, we have, we're a big family and we're very different from one another. And sometimes we don't get along. Sometimes we have different opinions. But we can keep coming back to loving one another, which means we need to respect one another and look out for one another and think about others. You know, this passage has challenged me. I get, I can get irritated with people because, you know, the, the church family so, being so big, we have so many different personalities, it's easy for friction to start happening. We start to rub each other the wrong way. And we need to remember to love one another be compassionate. That way we can be united. And he says this, be tender hearted, be courteous. And I love that word, tender hearted. And um, I want to read this to you because I thought it was pretty interesting. The Greek literally means uh, having strong bowels. That's what this word means. You need to have strong bowels. And I was so confused when I read that until I talked to Pastor Mark. In uh, ancient Greek thinking, the bowels down in here was the region where like emotion came from. So when you had compassion for someone, like the old King James says, Jesus moved with compassion. The idea is like moved in his bowels for, with compassion. And we joke saying like, next time you feel your bowels rumbling, you know, feel a little intestinal rumblings. It might be compassion or tenderheartedness trying to come out of you. Probably not, that's gross. Um, but you need to have strong bowels. It's this idea of like, the being clenched in, up inside, like being turned with emotion, that we would be kind and gentle towards one another, loving, be courteous. And I love that this word courteous could also be translated, be humble. Man, I love that. We're to be polite, respectful. We're to be humble. You know, it takes humility to be united with others. Because a lot of times I want to I want to have my opinion and my personal preference on something. And if you don't have it, well then, you know, good luck. And yet being like-minded, being compassionate, being loving as a family, being tender-hearted requires that you and I be humble. It takes humility. But look at Jesus. He is our example. Philippians talks about how the Lord emptied himself, stepped down from his throne in heaven. He's equal to God, but he made himself a servant, the lowest form of a servant even. 
And then he was obedient to the point of the cross, to death on the cross. He's our picture of humility. If Christ could do that for you and I, then we need to do it for each other. We need to be willing to step down, you know, from our, we're not like Christ. Christ is God, right? He's, he is equal to God, but you and I, we, we put ourselves on fake pedestals and think of ourselves higher than we ought to think. And that's the enemy of unity. And we need to step down and, and take the low place and look out for one another and be humble towards one another. Verse 9 says, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. My parents taught me when I was young, two wrongs don't make a right. It just doesn't work that way. Not reviling for reviling. That's the idea of like criticism, insulting one another. Man, our world is in so much turmoil right now. People trying to right one wrong by doing another wrong. Because of a past wrong, we, we uh, commit a present wrong to rectify it. And, you, and we see it just doesn't work. It creates chaos. On a political, pers- uh, a political platform, you see reviling for reviling. It makes me sick. Probably makes you sick too, just watching the leaders of our nation bicker and criticize and hate on one another and insult one another and talk bad about each other. And you, you know what? Though? That's, you and I need to be cautious that we're not doing that with each other. It's so easy for the flesh to get in and start coming out. We start treating each other poorly. We start slandering and talking bad about someone behind their back and someone criticizes us. So we just turn and we criticize them back. Someone insults. So we insult back. Someone creates a wrong. So we wrong back. And and Peter here would say, no, that's not the heart of God at all. In fact, he says, but on the contrary, blessing." That's how we're to respond to those who treat us with evil or revile us, insult us, criticize us harshly by giving them a blessing instead. I love that. You know what Paul wrote? And uh, I don't remember where he wrote it. It's in my notes somewhere. Here it is. Romans 12, 19. He said, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You can't overcome evil with evil. You just can't. You have to overcome evil with good. Man, I love that. I love that so much. I just think of the cross. I think of Jesus on the cross, the perfect, holy son of God in all the world fallen and evil and wickedness and turmoil and the devil stirring it up and, and Jesus comes and he's, he's the epitome of good and he overcomes. He defeats the devil. He defeats sin. Through goodness, he overcomes. He gives himself on the cross. I love it. It's our example. We're to overcome evil with good. And I want to read you this passage right here because Jesus touches on this as well in his teaching in Matthew chapter 5. If you're not familiar with Matthew 5, I encourage you to go read it. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage, 5, 6, and 7. Super convicting. But this is what it says. There it is. Matthew 5, 44. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. We can all do that. Love those who are kind to us. Hate those who hate us. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Man, you just think Peter must be remembering the words of Jesus as he writes, we're not to return evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but we're to give a blessing instead. It's like he's just remembering the words of Jesus. We're to bless those who curse us. Do good to those, Jesus said, who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. When people mistreat us, our response is to be prayer for them. Check out what the Lord says, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what what reward have you? 
Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. You have to understand in Jesus' day, tax collectors were considered the worst of the worst. He says, what good is it if you can only love those who love you? Or you can only do good to those who do good to you. That's, that's what people who are considered the worst of the worst even do. But you want to be countercultural? You want to be different? Pray for those who use you. Bless those who curse you. Love those who hate you. And then you get to be like God. Because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's what Romans says. While we were still the enemies of God, defiant and rebellious, Christ died on our behalf. And you know what? It's that work of Christ that transforms rebellious, fallen, wicked people into saints. It is the love of God that transforms us. Guys, we will never overcome evil with evil. We will only overcome evil with good. I love it. Praise the Lord for that. So let's keep going. So he's going to talk about this blessing. He says, on the contrary, we're to respond with blessing into verse nine, knowing that you were called to this. We're called to it. God has called us to this lifestyle that you may inherit a blessing. God's called us to this that we might in the end inherit a blessing as well. Check out what he says. He who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Man, I love it. Do you love life? Do you long to live a life that is a good one, that is satisfying and full? That's what he's saying here. Do you want to see good days? Well, he's quoting from the Psalms, by the way. He says, well, let him refrain his tongue from evil. Don't be speaking evil. Don't be doing evil in his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. And you know what? That's impossible in your own strength. It's only possible through Christ. Only possible through his grace. You know what? You and I, we still find ourselves struggling to refrain from doing evil, don't we? I'm so thankful for the grace of Christ for his forgiveness, for his mercy. But the reality is, is apart from Christ, you're not gonna be able to overcome evil in your life. You're not gonna be able to keep your tongue from speaking evil. You're not gonna be able to keep yourself from being deceitful. Without the transformative power of Jesus in your life, you're not gonna be able to do it. I had, I had a friend, I had a friend in Brazil that I loved and hung out with him a lot. And we used to hang out most evenings and talk about the Lord. And he really, really wanted to be a good person. He loved the morales of the Bible. He loved the teachings of scripture. And I kept telling him that, bro, it's great. He's like, I'm gonna do it. I wanna be a good man. I said, but you can't do it without Jesus. You can't do it without surrendering your life to Christ because there's nothing good inside of you and me. It's him that makes us alive and awakens our spirit to obedience to him. Away from Christ, without Christ in me, I'm just dead in my sin. I don't have the ability to fight back. And my friend wouldn't hear me. It was hard kind of watching him take a, the wrong turn down the road, becoming the man he was proud that he wasn't. And you know, it's just... It's a clear warning and reminder, you can't do it apart from Christ. But in Christ, he said, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace, pursue it, pursuing peace. I love that. I'm so quick to seek justice. I'm so quick to seek my own retribution. I'm so quick to, to seek judgment on someone else. Jesus says, I'm to seek peace peace. I'm to pursue it. I love that. I think of an army 
trying to pursue the enemy to overtake them. But in this picture, it's peace. I'm to pursue it, to overtake it. Paul would write and say, you know what? As much as it depends on you and I, we need to live peaceably with the men around us. As much as it depends on you and I, and it doesn't mean we don't seek justice for those who are suffering injustice. We do. But as believers, we're also to seek peace. And this is what he says, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. What a blessing to have the eyes of the Lord on the righteous. Have you ever thought about that? As God's child, his eyes are on you. He's looking at you. I think of my son, Malachi. He may not know it, but his mother and I are almost always watching him. He may be in his swing, enjoying the afternoon. He may be in his little playpen, playing with his toys. He's got this little uh, jungle canopy that goes over him. The toys shake and make jungle sounds. And he may be in there swatting at those playing. He may be, you know, playing his rattle or or doing, you know, whatever he's doing, but. He may not be aware that his mom and I are always watching him, that our eyes are on him. I may be in the other room looking on something in the, working on something in the kitchen, but I'm turning to look at him and turning to look at him to make sure he's okay. And how true for you and I as children of God, his eyes are upon us constantly. The Lord is looking out for you and me. Sometimes we may feel like he's far away, but the reality is, is he's looking upon you and I as his children. What a comforting thought. And his ears are open to their prayers. So encouraging that God's ears, they're open to you and I, his children. And I think of my son, even just last night, I wake up to him crying in the night I'm you know waking my wife up like I think he's hungry and and we're just so attentive to his need our ears are open to him he starts to squawk we're listening sometimes I tune him out I'm not gonna lie sometimes as humans we have limitations but God has no limitation as his children his ears are open to us to our crying to our squawking to our need he hears you and I what a blessing for you and me that, we, that we're inheriting. That God's eyes are upon us. That his ears are open to us. But check out what this says. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. How sad in contrast. Those who do righteousness, God looks upon them. God hears them. But those who do evil, God's face is towards them. But it's against them. Uh, That's the kind of way you don't want God's face against you. And maybe that's a word for someone out in the house churches tonight. Is God's face towards you? Is his eyes on you and his ears open to you? Or is, is his face against you? Set against you for judgment. Guys, God is a loving, compassionate, gracious God. He is full of compassion and mercy, and he is abundant in truth. But he is a just and holy God, and he will hold you and I accountable for our lives and for our actions. This is what makes the message of Christ so powerful. This righteousness that we talk about, that God's eyes would be honest and his ears open to us, it's not by our own righteous deeds, but it's the righteousness that has been imputed to us, given to us because of our faith in his son, Jesus Christ. It's, it's a free gift that you receive by faith and the work of Jesus Christ. And maybe you're listening today and you're, you're not right with Christ. I love Mark's analogy from like four Sundays ago when he's talking about the church in Laodicea that, and God is knocking at the door of, of our hearts, longing to come in. And maybe you've never given your life to Jesus and he is knocking on the door of your heart saying, let me make things right. Let me make peace between you and the Father. When Christ comes into our lives, his work is peace between us and God because we are forgiven, cleansed in total. 
All of our sin washed away and God and God accepts us as his own children. And he says we're righteous and holy, not because of anything we've done, but because of the righteousness and holiness of Christ that is imparted to you and me through faith. In a face that might have been set against us, his eyes are now upon us and his ears open to us as his children to look after us. Where are you at with Christ? Tonight? Is he knocking on the door of your heart? Would you turn to Jesus? I mean, God's ears are, would be open to you. His eyes would be upon you if you just turn to Jesus. And let me drink a little bit of water. Last night was our worship night. It was so powerful, so powerful, singing outside with like the canopy heaters going on and the lights and the worship was just powerful. We're going to do it again. So if you missed out, don't worry, but make sure to stay tuned for the next one because it was just a great time of worship. But my, my voice is a little gone this morning, so I apologize. Verse 13 says, and we'll wrap this message up. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And so this is what Peter is saying here. He says, who's going to harm you if you're doing what's right? And yet we know that that's not how it always works in the world. That, we, that when we do what's right, oftentimes we are treated wrongfully. And Peter knows that. So he says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. You, you're inheriting a blessing. You're still blessed if you suffer for doing what's right. In fact, going back to Matthew 5, this is what Jesus says. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. God's going to reward you for doing what's right even when you're treated wrong in return. So hang in there. You're still blessed and do not be afraid of their threats nor be troubled, but sanctify, set apart the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. So sanctify the Lord God. That word is to be set apart. Sanctify. God is to have a position in our heart that is set apart for him. He's to be set aside or set apart as the Lord of our life. He's to be the one who sets upon the throne of our heart. Our attention, our focus, our desire, it's to be on him. We're to sanctify the Lord, set him apart in our hearts. We're to be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks. And I find this so comforting. I, I think it was um, John Corson, yeah, who said he doesn't believe this means a theological response, like a, like a debate, like an argument. And I know because when you read this, it can feel overwhelming. Like, oh my gosh, like I have to go take all these apologetic classes and all these things. And the idea here is giving a defense like in a courtroom. But I love what John Corson says. It's giving the simple answer for the hope that is within you. And when I see Paul before King Agrippa or, for, or before Felix, I just see Paul giving a, a simple answer for the hope that is within him sharing what Christ has done in his life, sharing what Christ has done in our lives and, and, and explain why we act the way we act because of who Jesus is to us and what he's done. And you can do that. It, it may sound like a scary thing, but the Lord is with you. You can do it through the power of his spirit. In fact, Jesus said to his disciples, when you get drugged before rulers and councils and all these things, and they're, they're going to question you, he said, don't premeditate what you need to say. He said, but speak in the moment. It's going to be the Spirit of God speaking through you. And in that moment, when something comes up and you need to give a defense, just open your mouth and trust that God is going to speak through you and just give a simple answer for the hope that is within you. People can't argue with that. 
People can't argue with your testimony, what Christ has done for you. So always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. I love that. With meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed, right? So our conduct is supposed to be right before the Lord. We're to choose to do what's good, not evil for evil, but walking in obedience to God, having a good conscience that when people revile us, when they speak evil against us, when they try to defame us, that they would be ashamed because of our godly conduct. And I don't know if that will always happen in this life, but it's going to happen at some point where they realize they made a mistake. And he says, For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Hey, if it's the will of God to suffer, let it be for what's right. Because if you suffer because you're doing what's right, well, then you're going to receive a blessing. There's a reward for that. But if you suffer for doing what's evil, that's the stupid tax. That one's on you. So I'm going a little bit faster here, but I want to get through 18 through 22. It's a bit of a confusing text, and we're just going to go through it, and I'm going to give the best answer that I know how for it, Um, and then we'll pick up in chapter 4 next week. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. And I'll come back to that in a second. By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who were formerly disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an anti type which now saves us baptism, not the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Whoa, you might be like, what does that mean? Well, let's go back and walk through it together. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Christ suffered once for For since the work of the cross, it was the innocent dying in the place of the guilty. You and I are the guilty. Jesus, the innocent, he died in our place. The just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. That's the work of the cross, the death and resurrection of our Lord, that he might bring us to God that he might make a way for you and I to come back to God and be restored. You know, this word in Romans and in Ephesians is also used, this word bring, but it's not interpreted as bring. It's actually translated as access. And I love that, that Jesus did what he did to give us access to God. You have to understand in the Old Testament, nobody had access to God. Just the high priest, and once a year, he would come before the presence of God to offer an atonement for all of Israel. And now through Jesus Christ, we all have access to God. Through the blood and the finished work of Christ on the cross, you and I can come before God and, fi- and find mercy in his presence. We have access to God. He has brought us to God. And man, my heart just goes out. Maybe, maybe you're listening to this you, and you don't have that kind of access to God yet. And you're pondering and thinking about the work of the cross and, and just know that Christ died for you, rose for you to bring you to God. That you could have access to God, that you could be saved, that I could be saved. Being put to death in the flesh, right? He died on the cross, but made alive by the Spirit. Resurrected by the Spirit of God. Which I love for a few reasons. One, it says here that the Spirit resurrected Jesus. But in a different passage, it says the Father resurrected Jesus. And in a different passage, Jesus said he was going to lay down his life, but he was going to take it up again. And I love that because you see in the resurrection, the triune God working. 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The other thing I love about this is the fact that it's the Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead. That's the same Spirit of God that lives in you and me. We talked about that in our last house church message. It's the dynamis, dudamus, dynamic, dynamite power of the Holy Spirit that is given to you and I, God's children, to accomplish His will, to walk in obedience, to let go of evil, to refrain from doing evil. It's the power of God. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and me. I love that. It's the reason I can give a a defense for the hope that's within me because the power of God lives in me. The, The spirit of God lives in me. So he died in the flesh, but made alive by the spirit by whom also he went and preached to spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when the long, when the once, div, blah, sorry, when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls were saved through water. So he's hitting at two different things here. And one of them is really unclear. I'll talk about that one first. Christ went and preached to spirits that are in prison. People have interpreted that in multiple different ways. It's hard to know for sure. But this is what I think the best translation of that is. And the clue here is where he says, "Um, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah. What's it talking about? Well, when Christ Christ died, we know that he descended into the earth and that he led captives out of captivity and led them, you know, I think it's, what is it? He took captive, he made captive, captivity captive and led prisoners on high, something like that. I think it's from Isaiah. It's speaking of the work of Jesus emptying Hades. Now you understand that Hades is divided into two places, all right? One we know as hell, the other was known as paradise. And you see that a few times in the New Testament. Jesus gives the parable of the man Lazarus who dies and he goes to a place called Abraham's bosom and the the rich man who also died around the same time and he goes to a place that's like hell it's torment and there's a divide between the two and there's this crazy conversation going on between Abraham Lazarus and this guy that's in hell and so we know that it was like that there there was a holding place of paradise and a holding place of torment before the finished work of the cross And when Jesus spoke to the thief, if you remember, when he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise, not heaven, paradise. But when Christ died, he went down to Abraham's bosom, that paradise, and he emptied it. He led those captives out. Those were those who had died in faith from the beginning of creation, Adam and Eve, all the way up to uh, the thief on the cross. Those who had died looking to the fulfillment that was going to come through the Messiah, the future fulfillment of the cross, dying in hope, waiting in hope. That's where they were waiting at, resting at. But when Christ died and the work was finished, those people were brought up into heaven. And now for you and I, when we die to be separate from our body is to be present with the Lord in heaven. There's no longer a place of paradise or Abraham's bosom that we go down to and we wait for Christ to come get us. It's not like that because the work of the cross is finished. That when when we die, we are now present with the Lord. Now, for those who don't believe in the Lord, when they die, they still go to hell. They still go to the other side of Hades, that compartment that is torment where they wait to stand before God in judgment where there will be an exile to the lake of fire. And that's the second death, the Bible says, and you don't want to die it. That one's the worst. You don't want it. So turn to Christ while you, while you can, right? Because you, you, no one comes back from the second death. You can come back from the first death. We might all die, but no one comes back from the second death. That's the final judgment. So he's not talking about that though. Some people think that's what he's talking about, but that's probably not what Jesus is talking about here, what Peter is talking about here. It would seem like from this text that Jesus also went and preached to some other spirits who were in prison. And people attach this back to Genesis chapter 6, if you remember. There are these wicked spirits, these wicked demons, fallen angels, that see the daughters of men, and they go and start having relationships with them 
and they create these giants and powerful people on the earth. And it was an abomination in God's eyes. And some people would interpret this, and I would have to see it that way too, that God is going to those spirits that are locked in a prison in the earth, and he's preaching his victory to them. He's letting them all know what he has accomplished on the cross, that sin is defeated, their power is broken, and that his blood is victorious in his children. And I find that incredibly comforting because in in Revelation it says that we overcome the devil. Those who overcome the devil have overcome them by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. That he who is living inside of us is stronger than he who lives in the world. Jesus proclaiming his victory over his people and what he has done. I love that interpretation of this passage. Some, like John Corson, would see those spirits as the same ones that are going to be released from the abyss in Revelation, which I find interesting because we'll talk about that more um, when we get to Revelation, but they're not going to be able to torment those who have the mark of God. And once again, I find that unique that Jesus would go down, if it's true, to those same spirits and preach his victory to them. So I'll let Mark get into that in Revelation when he gets there. But today we're going to keep going from there. So what's he talking about here? This part about Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through water. There is an anti-type which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What is he talking about here? He's drawing a parallel, just like Noah was saved from judgment through water in his whole household. Peter's saying, hey, that's a picture for you and I of baptism. That we're fully immersed in water and we come out. And yet, some people look at this and they mistakenly go, well, then it's baptism that saves us. I have to be baptized to be saved. Well, that's not what Peter's actually saying here. I remember working with a junior high kid years ago, and he thought being baptized meant you you were saved. Not so much surrendering your life to the Lord or giving your life to the Lord Jesus, but you just go get baptized and you're saved. Hold on one second. Let's look at it deeper. There is also an anti-type which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh. Here's the key. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. What makes baptism so powerful? It's what it stands for. It's what it represents. It's what it speaks. It is... It is the answer of my conscience toward God. Baptism is me declaring that I've given my life to the Lord and I go under the water. My old man is dead. That's what's a picture of just as Christ was buried. So I'm now buried in Christ. I'm, I died with Christ and I'm brought back, brought to life in the newness of life that Christ has given me. Just as he has resurrected and come back from the dead, now i am also come out of death into life and I have a newness of life and a new power and a new order through his work on the cross. And you and I, it's not so much the, the, uh, the ritual of baptism that saves us, but the confession of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It has to be so. And we know that because that's taught all throughout Scripture. If it wasn't so, the thief on the cross couldn't actually have been saved. Or Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. I mean, he got saved right and died right there on the cross. And there are those who get saved on their deathbed and die and they still go to heaven because it is the confession of my heart that Jesus is Lord that saves me. That is witnessed in in the act of obedience through baptism. So what, what would I draw from all this? If you haven't been baptized and you are a child of God, you're in sin. I mean, that's uncomfortable to say, but that's true. You're in sin. You need to be baptized. You need to be obedient to God. If you have been saved and you're walking with the Lord, but you haven't been baptized, you're in sin. You need to publicly proclaim that decision unashamed, going under the water, coming up again, saying, I've chosen to follow Christ as my Lord and Savior. It is a small step of obedience that God calls all of us to. And if you haven't been baptized yet, you need to be baptized, and we would love to baptize you. You might be like, it's the winter, it's cold, it's okay. It's just, 
15 minutes, you'll be wet. It's all right. A small price to pay just to, just to walk in obedience to God and just say, yes, Jesus, you are my Lord. I believe that. I've, I've believed that. I've called on you as my Lord and Savior. I've confessed you as my King. I'm ready to take that step of obedience and proclaim you publicly, to witness it publicly that I'm yours. So you need to be baptized. But the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 22, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. The work is completed. Christ now sits triumphant, victorious at the right hand of God. In fact, he is the perfect example of someone who came, suffered, and inherited a blessing. Jesus came, suffered for you and I. He's been exalted to the name above all names, to the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He sits at the right hand of God. All powers in this world have been made subject to him. He's Lord over all, master of all. And that's a beautiful word for the church, and I'll leave us with that. The church can never be defeated or overcome unless someone is first to overcome or defeat Christ. And yet we know that man tried to, to kill him. The devil tried to defeat him. Evil tried to overcome him. And yet Jesus rose victorious. And he is alive and well, seated in victory at the right hand of God. And because of that, his church too will never be defeated, will never be overcome because we have the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony in Christ. So God bless you guys. Go ahead, talk about it in discussion. There's a little bit of a longer text. Um, maybe some of you guys have some questions based upon it. Now would be a good time just to talk with one another over it. So God bless you guys. We'll catch you again next week.